Welcome to our nutritional testing report review video. Today we'll be spending most of our time focusing on the NutriVal profile, but it's also important to recognize that the NutriVal profile relates to many of our other nutritional tests, such as the Metabolomics Plus, Organic Acids, Amino Acids Analysis, and some of our other sub-profiles of the NutriVal. We'll be covering several objectives in this video. First, we'll cover core concepts important to nutritional evaluation. We'll understand each section of the NutriVal report, including the results overview pages and the organic acids, amino acids, essential metabolic fatty acids, oxidative stress, and nutrient and toxic elements. We'll discuss how there are two NutriVal options, the plasma and the first morning void analysis, and this is mostly relevant to the amino acid portion of the NutriVal profile. Last, we'll be able to recognize important biomarkers and patterns that will assist you in interpretation of our nutritional testing. There are several important concepts to be aware of when discussing different types of nutritional assessment. First, there is the difference between a functional versus a direct measurement. A direct measurement looks at how much of a nutrient can be measured in a sample type. A good example of a direct measurement would be a serum B12 or an RBC folate. These tests simply quantify the amount of nutrient that was found in a sample. A functional analysis identifies the cellular needs for nutrients by taking into account numerous biochemical pathways that are dependent on that given nutrient. For example, the organic acid, methylmalonic acid, is a product that is created when there is low availability or utilization of B12 within the cell. This can occur independent of plasma B12 levels and is a better indicator of vitamin B12 need. By analyzing numerous biochemical pathways, the NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus identify nutrient insufficiency based on the evidence of needs within the cell. Intracellular versus Extracellular the difference between an intracellular and an extracellular test is a common discussion topic that mostly relates to whether the nutrient is being tested in the serum or plasma, or whether it's being tested in a red blood cell or white blood cell. The NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus tests assess nutrient status by looking at both intracellular and extracellular assessments. As mentioned previously, a functional nutrition assessment analyzes biochemical processes that are occurring within the cell. Also, in some circumstances, direct measurements are included as part of the overall evaluation, such as with red blood cell magnesium and potassium. By combining intracellular and extracellular measurements, the NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus leave no stone unturned when identifying nutritional need. Another important facet to a functional nutrition test is that many biomarkers on the test provide insight into the nutritional needs of your patient, and they may also have direct clinical application such as being an indication of a specific disease or disease process. For example, the organic acid quinolinic acid can indicate a potential need for vitamin B6, and it has also been shown to be associated with inflammation and neurotoxicity. Therefore, the more you learn about a functional nutrition test, the more you begin to understand the relationships between nutrition and chronic disease at a cellular level. Lastly, it's important to understand the potential ways that supplements can influence the findings on the test. In general, if you're trying to look at the baseline nutritional status of a patient, you may want to discontinue supplementation prior to testing. Note that water-soluble nutrients, such as B vitamins and vitamin C, will likely wash out of the system more rapidly than fat-soluble nutrients, such as vitamin D and fish oil. Alternatively, some clinicians prefer to have patients continue their current supplementation to evaluate efficacy, this decision is left up to the treating physician. Let's take a quick look at the various sections of the NutriVal report. On the front page, we have the results overview graphic, which provides a quick glance at the severity of the results. At the bottom of the front page, we have the functional imbalance pillars, which we will discuss in a moment. Page 2 is a nutrient need overview, which displays the synthesis of nutritional needs based on all the analytes measured on the test. The next several pages are the interpretation at a glance pages, which will give an overall score for the need for support of each nutrient. These pages are designed as an aid in patient education around the importance of nutrients and how to better obtain them in the diet. Page 7 is the oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction pathway page, also known as the Krebs cycle page. 
This page helps us understand the process of cellular energy production and all the nutrient cofactors involved. Page 8 is where we begin listing the individual analytes measured on the test. We start with the organic acids. Then, we list the oxalate markers and oxidative stress markers, such as glutathione, followed by organic acid pathway graphics to demonstrate the utility of organic acids in assessing nutrition. Page 10 is our amino acid page. Page 11 lists the essential and metabolic fatty acids, followed by the fatty acid metabolism pathway graphic. On the last page are the nutrient and toxic elements. Let's now dig into each section of the report in more detail. The front page of the report is a synthesis of information based on the results of the test. The clinical information provided here gives you an overall understanding of various dysfunctions that can be assessed on the NutriVal and metabolomics. The top section of the report is the results overview graphic. Here you can see color metric icons for each functional imbalance that is assessed. These icons correspond to the score from each functional pillar listed below. If you also use the GIFX comprehensive stool profile, you will be familiar with the overall design and function of this report synthesis. Underneath the results overview are the five functional imbalance pillars, which contain an overall score for the area and all the individual biomarkers that contribute to that score. These sections include oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, omega imbalance, toxic exposure, and methylation imbalance. Above each of the functional imbalance pillars is a key to help you categorize the score and their corresponding color. A green score of 0 to 4 indicates that there is minimal need for support in that area. A yellow score of 5 to 7 indicates a need for moderate support, and a score of 8 to 10 indicates a high need for support, which will show up in red. The functional imbalance scores are derived from an algorithm based on the results of the test. This algorithm takes into account the biomarkers that are listed below the score for each pillar. This complex analysis transforms the patient's results based on two factors. First, it takes into account how abnormal the biomarker is, or the severity. The other contributing factor is based on the strength of the evidence for that biomarker. For example, the more peer-reviewed literature has demonstrated an association between the biomarker and the clinical dysfunction, the more weight it is given in the algorithm that generates the score. You will also notice that next to each of the biomarkers listed in the pillars is an icon, such as a circle or a triangle. This icon corresponds to the patient's actual result on the test. A red triangle indicates that biomarker was outside the reference range, or two standard deviations. The direction of the triangle, whether up or down, means the result was either high or low. A yellow triangle means the result was outside one standard deviation, but not outside the reference range. A result falling in this yellow section is commonly referred to as borderline. A green circle indicates that the biomarker was within the normal or optimal range and was within one standard deviation. If an NA or not available appears, this indicates that this analyte was not run on the test. If all the analytes in a single pillar list not available, then the overall score will also be not available, which may happen in the case of a sample quality issue. Let's briefly discuss what these categories are. First, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, essentially, is evidence of free radical damage. This damage can occur to cell membranes, DNA, fats, and proteins, and you'll see biomarkers listed here, such as lipid peroxides, 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, and glutathione. Oxidative stress is associated with many clinical conditions, such as cardiovascular disease risk, metabolic dysfunction, cancer disease, among others. Mitochondrial dysfunction is the second pillar. The mitochondria serve as the power plant within the cell. They are responsible for generating cellular energy in the form of ATP. When there's mitochondrial dysfunction, this leads to poor cellular energy production. There are many clinical associations discussing mitochondrial dysfunction, such as cardiovascular disease risk, diabetes, insulin resistance, and metabolic dysfunction, mood disorder, chronic fatigue, cognitive decline, and many other conditions. The next pillar is the omega imbalance pillar. This score takes into account the concentration and balance between things like omega-3s and omega-6s. 
This score is a good indication for potential inflammation in the immune system, as we know how omega balance relates to potential pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory consequences. Toxic exposure looks at heavy metals and heavy metal exposure. It also takes into account things like plastics and petrochemical exposure, as well as some indicators for antioxidant need. Methylation imbalance looks at analytes that are related to the methylation pathway as long as evidence for poor methylation cofactors. You may consider something like the methylation panel if you find evidence of a methylation imbalance for a patient. As mentioned before, if you're familiar with running the GIFX stool profile, you will notice a similar layout on the front page. These front pages are designed to be a results overview and quick synthesis so you know exactly where to start and how to prioritize your intervention based on the results. Now, let's take a look at the second page of the report, which is the Nutrient Need Overview page. The Nutrient Need Overview page evaluates the evidence for a patient's need for nutritional support. It looks at seven nutritional categories. These include antioxidants, B vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, GI support, vitamin D, if that's ordered as an add-on, and amino acids. By looking at the categories as a whole, you can get a sense of the main headlines of the test. For example, if you see that a certain category, such as the B vitamins, consistently have values in the yellow and red, that would tell you that clinically the B vitamins would be an important area to support. The nutrient needs are generated based on a complex algorithm that takes into account various biomarkers throughout the test. As with the scores on the front page, the algorithm is weighted based on severity and the strength of the association between a biomarker and the nutrient according to the peer-reviewed literature. You will notice that each nutrient is evaluated on a 0 to 10 scale with 10, or red, indicating the highest need for support. To the right of the nutrient need score is listed the daily recommended intake for that nutrient for reference. The suggested recommendations is based on the nutrient need score and can serve as a guide for patient education and intervention. Both the daily recommended intake and the suggested recommendations are adjusted for age and gender. Finally, the last column is left blank for provider recommendations. This is where you, the clinician, can take into account the various aspects of the patient's clinical presentation and case history in order to ultimately make a therapeutic recommendation. Toward the bottom of the front page is listed the section GI support. The need for GI support is broken into two categories. First, the need for digestive support, or enzymes, looks for evidence of maldigestion and malabsorption. The dose recommendation for digestive support corresponds to the amount of lipase that might be found in a digestive enzyme. However, it's important to note that other factors should be considered, such as hypochlorhydria, when there is a high need for digestive support. The microbiome support, or probiotics evaluation, assesses needs for addressing dysbiosis. While the recommendation corresponds to probiotic intervention, it is also important to consider other factors that promote microbiome health, such as prebiotics and dietary fiber intake. If vitamin D is included as an add-on, it will follow the GI support section. Finally, at the bottom of the page are the amino acid recommendations. These are based on the direct measurements of the amino acids. This section can give a more global indication for protein intake and utilization. For example, if you see lots of zeros in this section, this indicates that there is likely adequate amino acids. If there are many recommendations showing up, you may want to support adequate amino acid intake as well as protein digestion and absorption. Now let's look at the layout for the interpretation at a glance pages. Here we are looking at the antioxidant page. For each nutrient that is assessed, you will see the severity of need for that nutrient on the green, yellow, red bar, followed by the score for nutrient need. As with all the scores on the test, the higher the score, the greater the need for support. Underneath the score, there is additional information regarding each nutrient separated into four categories. These categories are the function of the nutrient, such as its role in the body, common causes of deficiency, complications of deficiency, meaning what might result clinically after a prolonged deficiency, and lastly, common food sources of the nutrient, which can help you tailor a more robust dietary strategy. As a whole, the interpretation at a glance pages provide a robust tool to help explain the results of the test. You may find yourself focusing on these pages mostly when going over test results with your patient. As the rest of the report contains the analytes that were tested, 
you may choose to focus your patient visit around these interpretation pages, owing to the fact that the rest of the report can lead into complex biochemistry. This commentary can help you explain the importance of nutrients and highlight key food sources that you may focus on encouraging to improve nutritional insufficiencies. From here on in, we get into the actual analytes that were being measured on the test. Keep in mind that these analytes serve as the data that were used to generate the nutrient need recommendations as well as the functional imbalance scores on the first half of the test. We start with the organic acids. Organic acids are compounds made in various metabolic processes. They are often considered to be metabolic byproducts or end products. In general, organic acids give many indications of needs for vitamin and mineral cofactors. The organic acids are grouped into various sections based on their clinical utility. The next page of the report is the oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction page, also known as the Krebs cycle page. This pathway graphic first allows you to understand how a functional nutrition evaluation works and helps you recognize that the NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus are both an intracellular assessment as well as a complex metabolic fingerprint of cellular function. These pathways describe what is taking place inside the cell at a given moment. On this page, the patient's results are highlighted in either green, yellow, or red, depending on whether the analyte is normal, borderline, or abnormal. This allows you to visualize where there are backups in cellular metabolism and where the trouble spots might be. This metabolic pathway is ultimately showing how macronutrients such as fats, carbohydrates, and protein go through a complex process to ultimately turn into energy for the cell in the form of ATP. By looking at the patient's results in this format, you can quickly tell where the backups are and which nutrients might be considered to alleviate the problem. Let's look at an example. In this example, we'll be looking at the top left-hand side of the page. This is where fatty acids are converted into acetyl-CoA by beta-oxidation. This process requires magnesium and vitamin B2 to bring fatty acids into the mitochondria and ultimately to be converted into acetyl-CoA. Should there be a cellular insufficiency in one of these cofactors, then what will happen is fatty acids will turn into levels of adipic acid and suberic acid in a side process known as omega oxidation. Therefore, elevated levels of adipic acid and suberic acid act as an indicator for needs for vitamin B2 and magnesium. Furthermore, Elevated levels of adipic acid and suberic acid play a role in the overall recommendations for magnesium and vitamin B2. Applying this logic to the rest of the page, we can start to see that we are looking for backups in these pathways that may give us indications of nutrient needs. We start at the top, where fats, carbohydrates, and protein can ultimately turn into acetyl-CoA. However, there are various nutrients that are required along the way. If there are backups in these processes leading to abnormal findings on the test, it will trigger the algorithm to contribute points toward additional support for that nutrient. From acetyl-CoA, you will notice the process labeled ketogenesis, which results in the product beta-hydroxybutyric acid. This is a ketone body. Ketones are made in response to a couple clinical conditions. First, if the patient is on a low-carbohydrate or ketogenic diet, you would expect to find higher levels of ketones. Second. Ketones can be made in response to recent high-endurance exercise training. In the absence of these clinical conditions, elevations in urinary ketones has been shown to be an indicator of worsening glycemic control, such as in insulin resistance and diabetes. Aside from ketogenesis, the other important pathway listed here is the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is a stepwise process that is important in generating electron donors that will be used in the electron transport chain at the bottom of the page. Clinically, we are looking for backups along the citric acid cycle that can indicate needs for nutrient support. The important cofactors are listed next to each step on the process. However, there are also potential inhibitors of these steps, such as things like heavy metals, listed in red circles. It's important to understand that all of this information is hardwired into the algorithm that generates the nutrient need scores and the functional imbalance scores. This page is less about having to identify nutrient needs, but rather in understanding how the test arrives at the nutrient recommendations. From the citric acid cycle, we have the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is responsible for creating the majority of ATP, which is used as cellular energy. 
The electron transport chain generates a lot of free radicals and requires the support of antioxidants. Here you see listed antioxidant evaluations, such as CoQ10 and glutathione. Also listed here are things like lipid peroxides, or 8-OHDG, which are signs of oxidative damage, which might give you more information about the antioxidant status within the cell. Overall, by looking at the Krebs cycle page, we get a global view of some of the important cellular processes. If we begin to see many abnormal values in the top half of the page, we can start to suspect there are nutritional needs that could be underpinning mitochondrial dysfunction. Furthermore, if we see abnormals on the bottom of the page around the electron transport chain, it may be an indication of increased oxidative stress and needs for antioxidants. The next two pages is where we start to look at the actual analytes on the test, starting with the organic acids. Let's take a look at the organic acids. The organic acids are split up into several main categories. There's the malabsorption and dysbiosis markers, the cellular energy and mitochondrial markers, the vitamin markers, neurotransmitter metabolites, toxin and detoxification markers, and finally, the oxalate markers. The first section of the organic acids is the malabsorption and dysbiosis markers. The malabsorption markers are an indication of potential malabsorption of protein, specifically certain amino acids. If amino acids are insufficiently absorbed in the GI tract, they can be fermented into the analytes listed under the malabsorption marker section. Therefore, an elevation of these markers may indicate protein malabsorption. The bacterial dysbiosis markers are products that are made by various bacteria within the microbiome. We look for overall trends in this section to help us evaluate potential gut dysbiosis. In general, if you begin to see a trend of elevations in this section, it may indicate the need for further GI evaluation, such as a stool profile. Because these metabolites are made by bacterial fermentation, the process of a bacterial overgrowth might be suspected when there are multiple elevations. Another factor to incorporate is the potential influence of diet in this section. As many of these markers are derived from the intake of dietary phenols, such as with berries, cherries, or wine, among other foods, a high intake of these items could cause higher findings. We especially see this when there are isolated significant elevations of one or two markers. The last portion in this section is the yeast fungal dysbiosis markers, including d arabinitol d arabinitol is a product made by certain candida species by acting on sugars such as arabinose. Elevations in d arabinitol may be an indication of the presence of candida in the system. The cellular energy and mitochondrial markers are listed next. These biomarkers are the same biomarkers that are on the previous pathway page. Here, they're just in a list format. They include the fatty acid metabolites, the carbohydrate metabolites, and the energy metabolites. In general, the cellular energy and mitochondrial markers provide insight into key cofactors needed in cellular energy production. They also have the capacity to evaluate ketone production, and multiple abnormalities may reflect a need for mitochondrial support. There are a couple additional markers listed under the carbohydrate metabolism section that are of interest. First, alpha-hydroxybutyric acid is an interesting organic acid that has been demonstrated in the literature as a marker for overall poor lifestyle habits, such as with drinking, smoking, and sedentary lifestyle. It has also been associated with poor metabolic function, such as with worsening insulin resistance and diabetes. Second, Beta-hydroxy-beta-methylglutaric acid is part of the HMG pathway that is responsible for the production of both cholesterol and CoQ10. An elevation in this marker may indicate additional need for CoQ10 support. Next are the vitamin markers. The vitamin markers are a collection of analytes that relate to specific needs for vitamin cofactors, mainly the B vitamins. The subheaders listed above each group explain the clinical relevance of each section, such as the branch chain catabolites, the methylation markers, and the biotin markers. In the parentheses in the subheader are listed the main vitamins that are being assessed by looking at these analytes. In general, the vitamin markers play a strong role in the overall B vitamin recommendations. The organic acid pathways, which are located on the following page, give you a greater understanding of how these analytes relate to vitamin cofactor needs. For example, you can see in the green circle the analyte methylmalonic acid, which is one of the vitamin markers. In this pathway, methylmalonyl-CoA can turn into succinic acid in the presence of adequate vitamin B12, which is needed as a cofactor. In the absence of adequate B12, 
methylmalonyl-CoA will be unable to turn into succinic acid and instead will turn into the byproduct methylmalonic acid. This is how the analyte is a functional indicator for cellular B12 status. The same rule applies to the marker for miminoglutamic acid, or FIGLU, and what are collectively known as the branch chain catabolites, or the alpha keto acids, listed in the middle here. The next section of organic acids are called the neurotransmitter metabolites. Again, the subheaders explain which pathway and or neurotransmitter the analytes relate to. The kynurenine markers relate to a specific pathway that comes from tryptophan. As you can see in the parentheses, these markers give strong indications for needs for vitamin B6. Another clinical pearl regarding the kynurenine markers is that kynurenic acid turns into the next marker, quinolinic acid. There is a good amount of literature that indicates quinolinic acid as having inflammatory and neuroexcitatory aspects. This is why you may want to pay particular attention to the kynurenic quinolinic ratio in your patients, which is listed as the third marker here. The catecholamine markers are byproducts of dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. While they are mainly used as indicators for needs for vitamin and mineral cofactors, many clinicians notice alterations in these markers in catecholamine excess or deficiency. Lastly, the serotonin marker is 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid, which is a breakdown product of serotonin. As such, it is not uncommon to notice elevations in this marker when a patient is on SSRI medications or 5-HTP supplementation. Also to note, it is estimated that over 90% of circulating serotonin is derived from production in the gut. As serotonin in the gut promotes motility, there is ample evidence that elevations in this marker are associated with irritable bowel syndrome, more specifically, rapid transit and loose stool. The toxin and detoxification markers give us some insight into potential issues with antioxidant production and environmental exposures. The first marker, pyroglutamic acid, is derived from glutathione recycling within the cell. When pyroglutamic acid is elevated, it's always good to compare this result to the raw value of glutathione, which is on the next page. In the literature, pyroglutamic acid has been shown to be an indicator for potential needs for glutathione precursors such as cysteine, glutamic acid, and especially glycine. Vitamin B6, magnesium, and zinc are also important cofactors for glutathione synthesis. The next marker, alpha-ketophenylacetic acid, comes from exposures to plastics and petrochemicals such as styrenes. There is a long list of plastics that contain styrene, but we commonly think of styrofoams, plastic bottles, plastic containers, and other items such as rubber compounds and varnishings. Alpha-hydroxyisobutyric acid is a breakdown product of the chemical MTBE. MTBE was a common gasoline additive that has been banned in the United States but still persists in our water and food supply due to environmental contamination. Lastly, erotic acid has been shown to be elevated in the context of excess hepatotoxicity, such as with chronic alcohol use or medications that provoke liver injury. The next page of the report contains the oxalate markers, creatinine concentration, oxidative stress markers, including antioxidants and oxidative damage markers, and then the organic acid pathways that we discussed previously. Let's talk a little bit about the oxalate markers. The oxalate markers, or oxalates, are a collection of markers that relate to a pathway called the glyoxalate pathway. Ultimately, these markers are clinically important as they relate to the ability to form oxalic acid. Urinary oxalic acid is strongly associated with kidney stone risk. Oxalic acid can originate both from the diet and endogenous production. Let's discuss the clinical utility of the oxalate markers a little further. As you can see here, the glyoxalate pathway is a complicated system that integrates compounds from amino acids such as glycine and serine with breakdown products from collagen and oxidative stress to form these metabolic end products found in the red here. These are the markers that are being assessed as oxalate markers. The three oxalate markers on the organic acid analysis are glyceric acid, glycolic acid, and oxalic acid. As a collection of biomarkers, the oxalate markers may provide insight into abnormal metabolism in the glyoxalate pathway, which we just showed, which ultimately could result in higher levels of oxalic acid. The oxalate markers may have specific clinical relevance to patients suffering from recurrent kidney stones, as high levels of oxalic acid are a strong risk factor in kidney stone development. 
Also, there's evidence to support the notion that increased levels of oxidative stress and or metabolic dysfunction may ultimately contribute to dysfunctional oxalate metabolism, leading to higher excretion of oxalic acid. It's important to know that oxalates come from both internal production, such as collagen turnover and oxidative stress, and external dietary intake. It's roughly 50-50. The first oxalate marker is glyceric acid. Glyceric acid elevations have been documented in a couple different clinical conditions. First, rare inborn errors of metabolism have been shown to lead to excessive urinary accumulation of glyceric acid. As these conditions typically manifest early on in life, this is less likely to be noticed in the general patient population. However, glyceric acid has also been studied in patients with conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and certain mood disorders such as schizophrenia and bipolar. Glyceric acid may accumulate in the presence of nutritional inadequacy of vitamin B3 and magnesium, as these are cofactors downstream in this pathway. Interestingly, vitamin B3 has been researched as a potential therapeutic intervention in the context of schizophrenia and bipolar. Glycolic acid, which admittedly sounds a lot like the previous analyte glyceric acid, can also come from an inborn error of metabolism in rare settings. However, in the general population, higher levels of glycolic acid are more likely to indicate increased oxidative stress. If you look at the bottom of the pathway here, you will see that oxidative stress can lead to production of the molecule glyoxal, which ultimately is neutralized into glycolic acid. Another important consideration is that high levels of glycolic acid may indicate increased consumption of collagen or increased collagen breakdown, such as in catabolic conditions. Finally, High levels of both oxalic acid and glycolic acid may reflect a need for vitamin B6, as this is the cofactor needed to metabolize glyoxalate into glycine. The last oxalate marker is oxalic acid, which has many of the similar clinical associations as glycolic acid that we just discussed. These include inborn error of metabolism, increased oxidative stress, intake or turnover of collagen, and needs for vitamin and mineral cofactors. Aside from these clinical associations, it's important to note that urinary levels of oxalic acid are most strongly associated with risk of kidney stone development. Interestingly, higher levels of oxalic acid have been also studied in the literature in the context of metabolic dysfunction, such as insulin resistance and diabetes. As worsening metabolic dysfunction is also associated with increased kidney stone frequency, this is a marker to look at in the context of metabolic syndrome. Next on the report, we have the oxidative stress markers. The oxidative stress markers are broken up into two sections, the antioxidants, which contain evaluations of glutathione and CoQ10, and the oxidative damage markers, including lipid peroxides and 8-OHDG. The oxidative stress section of the test is of vital importance. We tend to want to see all four markers in the green or optimal section to maximize antioxidant capacity and limit oxidative damage. The first antioxidant measured is glutathione. Glutathione is one of the body's most powerful and main cellular antioxidants. Having an adequate supply of glutathione is critical in order to protect cellular structures from oxidative damage by neutralizing free radicals. CoQ10 is another endogenous antioxidant that is intimately involved in cellular energy production. We often think about CoQ10 with regards to its importance in cardiovascular health. On the other side of the table are the oxidative damage markers. Lipid peroxides represent oxidative damage to fats and other lipid structures such as cell membranes. This is followed by 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, or 8-OHDG, which is a marker of oxidative damage to DNA. As DNA damage is associated with many chronic conditions, this is a marker we certainly want to focus on lowering as much as possible. The next page of the NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus report is the amino acid analysis. There are two different ways to order the NutriVal. You can order the NutriVal Plasma or the NutriVal FMV, or First Morning Void. Either test requires both a blood draw and a urine collection. The only difference between the two tests is with regard to how you would like the amino acids assessed. The amino acids can be analyzed in either the plasma or the urine. On the Metabolomics Plus report, the amino acids are assessed in the urine as there is no blood draw required for the Metabolomics Plus. There are a few things to consider when deciding between looking at amino acids in the plasma versus the urine. 
plasma amino acids tend to reflect more of a steady state of protein intake and can give you good clinical insight into the long-term adequacy of dietary protein consumption. Urinary amino acids tend to reflect a shorter window of time, such as the last few days of protein intake. Therefore, when doing urinary amino acids, it's important to instruct the patient to continue what would be considered their average diet in the days leading up to the test. Amino acids have numerous roles in the body and act as basic building blocks for all your cellular proteins and structures. They can also be used to generate energy, produce neurotransmitters, and make other signaling hormones, among other roles. Let's look at the essential and non-essential amino acids. The essential amino acids are so named because they must be obtained from the diet. Conversely, the non-essential amino acids can come both from the diet or through conversion from the essential amino acids, which require nutrient cofactors. Don't be confused by the name essential and non-essential regarding the clinical importance of these amino acids, as they all have vital roles to play in the human body. When we interpret the amino acids, first, it's important to look at the overall trend of the amino acids. Given the complexity of the human body, it's not uncommon to see some interpersonal variability, meaning a few results may bounce around high or low. Here, we have drawn a line down the amino acids to determine whether, on average, the amino acids are trending high, low, or pretty much down the middle. By taking a global view of the amino acid results, we can gain insight into dietary protein intake, the ability to digest and absorb protein, and the system's overall utilization of amino acids. If you've noticed specific abnormal results, you may want to investigate those findings in greater detail. To do so, I would recommend visiting the amino acid section of the NutriVal support guide to dig a little deeper. You can apply the same global view to the non-essential amino acids. Remember that the non-essential amino acids reflect both dietary intake and potential cofactor needs. One clinical pearl that you may see from time to time is when there are adequate levels of essential amino acids, but the non-essential amino acids are trending low. This may be an indication of needs for nutrient cofactors such as vitamin B6 and magnesium, as those are common cofactors needed in the conversion of the essentials to the non-essentials. Given that amino acid insufficiency can result from either poor dietary intake of protein or poor digestion and absorption of protein, the question becomes can we discern whether the amino acid status is a reflection of diet versus digestion? The dietary peptide-related markers can help you clinically to address this distinction because they help give an indication of protein intake. One methylhistidine is mostly derived from meat protein from chicken, turkey, and fish. Three methylhistidine is a protein that comes from red muscle fibers. This means that three methylhistidine can be a reflection of red meat intake or it can come from endogenous muscle turnover. We might expect higher levels of 3-methylhistidine following periods of intense exercise, where muscle turnover might be higher. In the absence of exercise and red meat intake, high levels of 3-methylhistidine could be a reflection of catabolic muscle wasting. It is good to compare the results of these dietary peptide-related markers to the overall trend of amino acids. If you notice normal or higher levels of the dietary peptide-related markers, however, the amino acids are trending low, this might tell you that the patient appears to be eating adequate amounts of protein, specifically meat, but they are not digesting and absorbing efficiently, leading to lower levels of the amino acids. Another clinical pearl is in the setting of vegetarian and vegan diets, where you might expect the dietary peptide-related markers to be low. If you notice elevations in 3-methylhistidine in these patients, you can derive that it is due to higher muscle turnover, whether from catabolism or exercise, owing to the fact that the patient is not eating red meat. On the right-hand side of the amino acid page, we have a set of biomarkers called the intermediary metabolites. These are biomarkers that add support to the algorithm around particular vitamins and nutrients or relate to other important amino acid pathways. The B vitamin markers are so named because they lend additional support to the potential need for select B vitamins. Many of these analytes come from pathways that are dependent on vitamin B6 and B12. The urea cycle markers can provide insight into overall dietary protein intake, utilization, and clearance as this is the system used to detoxify ammonia from amino acid breakdown. Lastly, the glycine serine metabolites contain the direct measurements of glycine and serine, which are themselves amino acids. This section also relates to a number of processes such as acetylcholine and phospholipid production. 
These pathways are heavily dependent on magnesium and methylation cofactors and play a strong role in those evaluations as well. Let's move on to the Essential and Metabolic Fatty Acids page, or EMFAs. On the NutriVal profile, the fatty acids are assessed via a red blood cell analysis. Packed red blood cells provide the most insight into the overall dietary intake and distribution of the individual fatty acids. The red blood cell fatty acid analysis provides a window into the steady state of roughly the last 90 to 120 days of fat intake, as this is the lifespan of a red blood cell. On the Metabolomics Plus, there is an add-on option to run a blood spot fatty acid analysis which can be collected at home. A blood spot analysis has been demonstrated to correlate well with the red blood cell analysis, although it may not reflect as long a window of time, owing to the contribution of plasma to the sample, which has a more rapid turnover time. Another important thing to understand about the fatty acid analysis is that analytes are reported as weight percent. Weight percent is commonly used in the literature compared to direct concentration, as it indicates the distribution and diversity of fats in the cell. The weight percent can be thought of like a giant pie chart that shows you the overall balance of fats. Because the analytes are reported as weight percent, each fatty acid percent affects each other. So, say for example, the percent of omega-3s increase, you would expect a concurrent decrease in the percent omega-6s and omega-9s. When we dig a little deeper into the fatty acid analysis, we see that each section contains individual fatty acids. Zooming in on the omega-3s, you will see listed ALA, which is the only essential omega-3 fat, followed by fatty acids you may recognize, such as EPA and DHA. It's important to look at the overall percentage for each category as well, which is listed in bold. By looking at the overall percentage, you can compare the balance of fats between the omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s, and saturated fats. This can give you insight into what type of fat that patient has been consuming over time. Another important section on the test is the cardiovascular risk section, which ends with the omega-3 index, a critically important biomarker. Many of us are familiar with the clinical importance of omega-3 fatty acids, as they are associated with decreased inflammation and important in the prevention and maintenance of many clinical conditions, including cardiovascular disease. Dietary sources of omega-3 fatty acids include cold water fish, nuts and seeds such as flax, chia, and walnut, as well as, of course, from any omega-3 supplementation. Two very important omega-3 fatty acids are EPA and DHA, which you may want to evaluate on every test to ensure their adequacy. However, when determining whether a patient is getting adequate omega-3, likely the most significant analyte is the omega-3 index, which has been vastly studied in the literature. The omega-3 index is easily calculated by adding the value of EPA plus DHA weight percent. Here, you can see the EPA at a 0.38 plus DHA at a 2.7 gives you the result of 3.1 for this patient a value that we would consider low. Research indicates that an omega-3 index below 4 is significantly associated with an increased cardiovascular disease risk and that an optimal range is likely between 8 and 10 or 12. After the omega-3s, we move on to the omega-9s, which are commonly obtained in the diet, especially through the consumption of olive oil. Omega-9s are also important fatty acids as they play a role in decreasing inflammation and assist with cell membrane formation, such as with nervonic acid. Desaturated fatty acids come from a variety of sources, such as animal products, as well as nuts and seeds. Overall, it's important to ensure a decent balance of saturated fats. The omega-6 fatty acids come from a variety of sources in the diet, including animal fats, grains, and things like nut and seed oils. We'll take a look in more detail at the omega-6s on the next page. The next page of the report is the fatty acid metabolism page. The two columns represent the omega-3 and omega-6 family of fatty acids. I find it clinically insightful to look at the omega-6 metabolism on the right-hand side. This shows how each fatty acid is converted one into the next down the cascade. We start with linoleic acid at the top, which is converted into gamma-linolenic acid, or GLA, this conversion takes place through the enzyme delta-6 desaturase, which is listed in the center column. Then, the next step is the conversion of GLA into DGLA, or dihomogamma-linolenic acid, through the enzyme elongase. 
DGLA is an important anti-inflammatory omega-6, which cannot be obtained through the diet and therefore must be created through these conversions. Underneath each of the enzymes in the center column, we have listed important regulators that may alter how well these reactions are taking place. Clinically, if there's inadequate vitamin and mineral cofactors, you may notice that these conversions are becoming increasingly sluggish, resulting in lower DGLA levels. The next step in omega-6 metabolism turns DGLA into arachidonic acid. As compared to DGLA, arachidonic acid can be used to create pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. It is important for there to be adequate levels of arachidonic acid to ensure inflammatory balance. However, we may want to watch out for high levels of arachidonic acid. Keep in mind, we can also get arachidonic acid in our diet from things like animal fats. Going back to the fatty acid page, the last area we haven't covered is the monounsaturated fatty acids. Particularly, it might be helpful to glance at the trans fat section. Trans fats most commonly originate from processed foods and hydrogenated oils. As these fats have been clinically associated with a variety of adverse impacts on the body, limiting exposure to trans fats is encouraged for all patients. The last page of the report contains the elemental markers, including the nutrient elements and the toxic elements. The nutrient elements are measured in a variety of matrices, depending on which blood component reflects dietary status most accurately. Some nutrients are measured in plasma, while others are measured in red blood cell or whole blood. Magnesium and potassium are assessed via red blood cell analysis, which is more of an indicator of nutritional status as compared to the more conventional serum magnesium and potassium, which is under more direct homeostatic control. Zinc and copper are measured in the plasma, which allows clinicians consistency with the literature and allows for direct comparison of the zinc-copper ratio. Manganese and selenium are measured in the whole blood. It's important to understand that these direct measurements of nutrients play a strong role in the overall assessment for that nutrient need and recommendation. However, the direct measurement is not the only factor that contributes to the algorithm. For example, the magnesium level here is showing up in the green optimal area. Therefore, it is not likely contributing to the recommendation for additional magnesium support. However, this does not necessarily mean that the overall magnesium need will be zero. Keep in mind that there are multiple analytes that can contribute to any given recommendation. Therefore, if there is evidence elsewhere on the test of potential need for support, it will influence the recommendation. This is not a discrepancy in the findings, but rather it demonstrates the utility of combining direct measurements with functional measurements. Last, we have the toxic elements, including lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. The toxic elements are measured in whole blood. A whole blood measurement allows for a comparison of the patient's results to the NHANES data from which three of the reference ranges are set. The toxic elements section provides a window into recent exposure and not necessarily body burden. Clinically, any elevations you see warrant further investigation into potential sources of current exposure. As these are whole blood measurements, the window of time of exposure may vary from a few weeks to a few months, given that whole blood contains both red blood cells with a longer half-life and plasma with a more rapid half-life. The reference ranges for lead, mercury, and cadmium are set according to the published NHANES data. The reference range for arsenic does not have published NHANES data, and therefore the range is set based on a questionnaire-qualified healthy cohort. There are a couple add-on options for the NutriVal profile, including a vitamin D assessment and certain genomic SNPs. The genomic SNPs can be added on individually and include MTHFR, COMT, APOE, and TNF-alpha. For an even greater dive into the clinical utility of these products, we have several additional resources available. We have a fully referenced comprehensive NutriVal and Metabolomics Plus support guide, which details every function and analyte on the report. We have a multitude of live GDX webinars on our website, www.gdx.net. And for one-on-one -on -one educational consults, you can always call 1-800-522-4762. Lastly, tune into our Lab Report podcast, which explores the latest information related to integrative and functional medicine and laboratory testing. This concludes the report review video for our nutritional products, including the NutriVal, Metabolomics Plus, and all related nutritional subpanels, such as the organic acids, amino acids, and essential and metabolic fatty acids. 
Thank you for watching this video, and I hope it has helped you cultivate a deeper understanding of the clinical utility of the most comprehensive suite of nutritional tests available.